Our brain is truly marvelous. Billions of neurons communicating each fraction of a second. The question is, how could it evolve? Welcome to Psyched. Experiencing the world around us and being aware of our surroundings and our own thoughts. This is what we know as consciousness. Although consciousness is an incredibly difficult topic with a myriad of unanswered questions, we can identify some pivotal building blocks of consciousness. A number of elemental processes that form a necessity to consider an organism to be conscious. These include our senses, which we have addressed in the previous four episodes. But a conscious experience requires more than that and reflects an interaction of various processes, including attention, emotion, long and short term memory, abstract thought, imagination, the ability to communicate, as well as a sense of self and others. Whether the interaction of these processes is sufficient for consciousness is a question for a philosophical debate. But what is clear is that these processes are intertwined with our conscious experience. Therefore, in the coming episodes, we will take a deeper look into how these processes related to consciousness evolved and which changes in brain structures coincided with these developments. In this episode, we will take a look at one of these building blocks, the evolution of attention. Selective processing and prioritizing some data from the environment over other data is what we know as attention. Our senses feed our nervous system with an enormous amount of information each second. Most of this information is not crucial for survival in a given moment. A filter that selects important information, such as the approach of a predator or locating edible food, therefore greatly benefits an organism. Attention evolved gradually over the last 500 million years and initially organisms only had some fluctuations in their alertness. First of all, being able to attend to any stimulus requires an organism to be awake. Sleep-wake cycles in vertebrates are regulated by networks in the brainstem. However, invertebrates, like jellyfish, who don't have a brain and only nerve nets with a few thousands of neurons, do have wakeful states and sleep states. The difference between sleep and awake states reflects the most basic form of a fluctuation in alertness. This suggests that even such simple nerve nets do modulate attentiveness to surroundings. As such, the earliest precursors of attention most likely evolved together with the earliest nerve nets at some time between 500 and 700 million years ago. Following the path of vertebrate animals' evolution, we see nerve nets forming into a tube, ultimately forming the spinal cord and the brainstem. From recordings in modern fish, it is found that at the time when vertebrates evolved, clearly differing states of arousal can be identified with distinct brain waves for sleep and wakefulness. Also, these observations have been linked to the evolution of the reticular formation. The reticular formation comprises of a group of networks and interconnected nuclei throughout the brainstem. It includes the rapha nucleus, locus ceruleus, the pontine reticular nucleus and the thalamic reticular nucleus, as well as many more. Altogether, the reticular formation has multiple functions, for example regulating sleep-wake cycles, sensory arousal and attention, but also muscle control and altering blood pressure and respiration. The functions of the reticular formation in living models of our fish-like ancestors, such as lamprey, are already quite developed and do, in essence, not differ strongly from reptilian or mammalian brainstem regions. As such, how the reticular formation evolved is speculative. But it has been suggested that simpler, non-centralized networks originally evolved in invertebrates and were centralized in the brainstem when vertebrates emerged. The section of the reticular formation that is most strongly coupled to attention 
is the so-called reticular activating system. The reticular activating system is connected to a variety of other brainstem areas that are involved with sensory specific attention. This brain system is crucial for animals to direct attention to environmental dangers. For example, a deer looking into the direction of where a wolf is approaching involves visual attention. Yet, a mouse hearing an approaching snake and turning its ears towards it requires auditory attention. For this hearing and vision specific attention, a brain area called the tectum evolved. This region is also present in humans. However, in mammals, this area is referred to as the superior and inferior colliculus. The tectum is located on top of the brainstem. Indeed, the Latin word tectum means roof. To focus attention, it is not only important to perceive a visual and auditory stimulus, it is also important to actually direct your attention towards it. This means move your head and body as well as direct your eyes and ears towards the thing you want to focus on. As such, the tectum is also connected to motor networks that are crucial for these attention-related movements. That means, whenever you're calling your dog's name, brain activity in that region will determine whether your dog reacts or not. Some aspects that lead to attention can be found outside of the brain. For example, the ability to attend by moving your eyes and your head is facilitated by the fovea. In the retina of the eyes, more cells are dedicated to the center of our vision. In other words, our eyes and visual brain areas receive more information in the middle of our visual field. Thus, moving your eyes and shifting attention are inseparable acts. How much more cells there are in the fovea compared to peripheral vision cells differs between species. For example, an eagle has five times as many cells in the same foveal area as humans. Additionally, eagles have a second fovea, helping them to look down during flight. The differences between foveal vision across species suggest that it may have evolved more than once. Nevertheless, the first foveas that helped us focus attention evolved in our fish-like ancestors more than 400 million years ago. Coming back to the brain, the ability to focus attention is further amplified by sensory processing in the telencephalon. The telencephalon is the part of the brain that in mammals evolved to be the limbic system and the neocortex. This part of the brain has dedicated regions for all our senses, such as visual cortex, auditory cortex, somatosensory cortex, and so on. Although the telencephalon is present in fish and amphibians, in them it is mainly involved in processing smell, since olfactory pathways do not run through the tectum. As such, this brain region initially evolved in our ancestors for attending towards interesting smells. This helped our ancestors to locate food, predators and potential mates. Being attracted by smell or moving your head towards the location where sound comes from are both crucial for survival. Yet, humans, as well as a variety of other animals, have the ability to shift focus without the presence of an external factor that catches our attention. For example, when focusing on a particular point, such as a fixation cross, we are able to shift our attention towards the right, where the cat is, or towards the left, where the dog is. We can do this at any time, without ever moving our eyes. This shift of attention is thus voluntary and is independent of what sensory stimulus is presented. This is what is referred to as top-down attention. Among other things, top-down attention is crucial for communicating, since it allows us to shift attention to different interacting partners. It is therefore not unreasonable to assume that most primates have at least some form of voluntary attentional control. However, it can also be observed in other species. 
being able to willingly guide attention also allows to attend away from an undesirable stimulus. Some dog owners will certainly recognize how their pets seem to attend away from them if they are scolded at. However, despite these anecdotal examples, it is very difficult to investigate top-down attention in non-human animals, since such self-directed shifts in focus are internally formed. Brain scans of human participants show activity in the prefrontal cortex during top-down attentional control. Indeed, evidence suggests that the prefrontal cortex sends signals to the thalamic reticular nucleus. As the name suggests, this part of the thalamus is not only connected to the prefrontal cortex, but also to the reticular formation in the brainstem. Additionally, the thalamic reticular nucleus has connections that go towards sensory brain areas. This suggests that this interaction between prefrontal cortex, thalamus and reticular formation is crucial for voluntary control of sensory attention. In other words, the network that is crucial for attentional control is distributed throughout the brain. The prefrontal cortex is part of the neocortex and can thus only be observed in mammals. Although it is sometimes argued that rodents do not have a distinct prefrontal cortex, projections between thalamus and frontal brain areas are observed. This seems to suggest that even earliest true-like mammals, some 250 million years ago, would have had the brain structures that are necessary for top-down attentional control. Whether they were actually capable of shifting attention at will remains a mystery. In primates, which evolved for the first time some 60 million years ago, we can observe an expansion of the prefrontal brain regions, with stronger connections to the thalamus. Additionally, we see that the prefrontal brain is connected to other regions such as the orbitofrontal and parietal cortex, which are important regions for cognitive performance in general. Furthermore, we know that during human evolution over the last 6 million years, brain size has increased threefold. Although this means that prefrontal and sensory areas have increased in size, when scaling our brains to that of great apes, the prefrontal areas do not seem out of proportion. So, in how far human brain size is related to attention is a question that is yet unanswered. Whereas being able to focus on stimuli in the environment is crucial for survival, attention by itself cannot give an indication of whether what we attend to is a positive or a negative thing. Some fruit hanging in the trees may have grasped the attention of our primate ancestors, yet whether this fruit is ripe and edible, or whether it is foul and poisonous, is not reflected by our attention. For this, some kind of evaluation is necessary, which is achieved by our emotions. Ripe fruit will bring excitement, whereas foul fruit will evoke disgust. Also, a predator will induce fear, whereas a mate will bring about happiness. Undoubtedly, emotions are as crucial to our conscious experience as attention is. Therefore, in the next episode of this series, we will focus on this other paramount building block of consciousness and how it and related brain regions evolved. That means we will take a look at the evolution of emotion. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we hope to see you the next time.